What's up, you guys? Welcome back to the Medicine Podcast. You got me, Mimi here, and <laughs> what's going on, everybody? <laughs> this is Chase. We are fresh off of an amazing trip up to Malibu, California, where we got to interview Lee McCloskey, just an incredible, one of a kind guest. For the mm -hmm. medicine. Yeah. And if you're like us and you usually skip the podcast intro, we're going to request that you hold tight, be patient, and just listen to our intro on this one. There's a reason why both of us are, you know, wanted to jump on and, and provide um, a little more context to our conversation and, you know, really just Lee in general. Totally. We got a chance to connect with months ago through a part of a shared community of, of spiritual individuals. And uh, we're just like, oh my God, we have to get this guy in the podcast. One, because he's incredibly intelligent and in the way that he articulates his thoughts is poetic and artistic. But two, he is quite literally one of the best artists I've ever seen oh in my, my entire life. Definitely. And he has evolved his home in Malibu, California into this multi-dimensional interactive art installation, yeah. which is why we wanted to take a little bit of time before we jump into the interview to at least layer some context in for you, the listeners and ideally viewers, mm -hmm. uh, because we're going to be showing some some footage of what this art looked like so that you have some context uh, for the conversation that we had with Lee up at his home. Yeah. So if you are listening to this on Apple or Spotify, you might actually want to jump over to YouTube and watch this so that you can see the, the sort of B-roll footage that we got of his space it is just absolutely it was honestly one of the coolest if not the coolest room i have ever been totally. in in my life not just cool but like astounding jaw-dropping and unique it was the feeling of staring at the most beautiful night sky in the in the middle of the forest where you're staring up and and the stars have never seemed more clear yeah and you're like oh my god this is here all the time <laughs> And yeah. stepping into that space, stepping into his home, and, and specifically uh, what we will call as Thoth's library, as I'll mm -hmm. describe shortly, uh, was that exact feeling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we get opportunities to connect with amazing people often, and that's one of the best things about the podcast. And and what you expect is usually, hey, this individual's got a, a few hours, yeah. um, and in this case, they might show us their work or take us through some of the things that they've done. In this case, it's, it's Lee's art. And then we set aside some time to... Uh, record an interview and a lot of times it's relatively calendarized and transactional mm -hmm. and you get in and you get out and stepping through Lee's door and connecting with him for the first time I felt just this energetic hug of mm -hmm. the fact that we're going to be here for the day yeah we're spending an entire day with this man and right away he starts literally describing his definition of what home feels like mm -hmm. and when you love something you protect it and when you deem something sacred and precious you protect it and he almost within minutes described his home in that way and we were both like let's let's go yeah, yeah. we're here at the foot of the master just sitting as sponges to observe uh to soak up uh as much wisdom as we could from this guy yeah absolutely so let's share a little bit about lee and um his background um just to give just to give you as the listener the watcher a little more insight into like who is he okay totally. he's a he's an artist yes but but let's get into it a little yeah, so Lee McCloskey, he's, he's a multifaceted artist is, is the way that I would put it. He's quite literally using brushes to create masterpieces through through paint, um, but he draws as well. But he's, he's actually an actor um, and an author as well. He has starred in movies, television, theater for decades. You might recognize, or maybe your parents, if you're like us, where you'd recognize the show Dallas or the show General Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a star on both of those shows, uh, which, which definitely rung a bell for me and, and definitely my parents. Uh, but in addition to his acting career, Lee is an accomplished author. He's written several books exploring esoteric and philosophical themes. Um, his work often, you know, delves into topics not unlike what we talk about on the medicine, consciousness, spirituality, metaphysics. Um, you know, a notable book is his book on the tarot called Tarot Revisioned, um, as well as a book that he mentioned to us multiple times uh, throughout the day that we spent with him was Adam Reborn and Eve Restored. His tarot book, which he showed us, it's this beautiful like coffee table style hardback book, includes an entirely new and unique series of drawings that he drew representing the 22 archetypes of the major arcana of the tarot. So these are new, almost 
what you would would want to call more relatable um, artistic representations of these archetypes that we've talked about on the medicine before um, being the the major arcana of the tarot and, and just beautifully done um, but he's he's maybe most notably recognized for his art and specifically his home uh, which is called Olandar and it's just like absolutely incredible name for his home yeah. <laughs> um, but he's created a diverse range of paintings and art installations that explore uh, the intersections of all these topics spirituality yeah. consciousness art the human journey and it often incorporates like really beautiful archetypical imagery mm -hmm. um sacred geometry i and want to pause you there just for a second because when you say art installation what that means you guys is he turned his home into the art piece yeah so his entire library is painted the the ceiling the floors the walls the books the couch the pillows the chair like everything is painted with these like undescribably beautiful pieces of art so the whole room is the art piece totally. so that's what we mean by art installation and very specifically this dedicated section of his of his home uh, his library is called the hieroglyph of the human soul AKA Thoth's library. Yeah. This is an immersive and symbolic art installation. The, the art of this incredible human being's mind was installed quite literally into the surface of his, of his home. Um, and it's, it's designed to evoke this almost psychedelic journey of exploration, this contemplation of the depths of our mm -hmm. human uh, and spiritual experience that we're having. It, it incorporates, you know, a host of different visuals. And, mm -hmm. and what he did to us over the course of two hours was walk us through this room um, from its, you know, generation point the point that he had this creative mm -hmm. um flow of energy to start painting and to start cohesively bringing these ideas that he's had together in the form of of this art installation um but it without drugs at all yeah 100 sort of like sober. sucks you into this uh vortex of fractal patterns and beautiful sacred geometry mm -hmm. and representations of things that seem um wild and and out of the box yet are resonating mm -hmm. they, it feels as if you've seen them before maybe in a distant dream or a distant lifetime or something um and he he sort of holds your hand through this process um points your eyes literally to your to your feet to to the ceiling maybe to your left or to your mm -hmm. right and explains these different images and how they work yeah, together yeah. to conjure something of meaning from from one who's stepping through this and and uh you know all of that to say this is what we were there for this mm -hmm. experience this mm -hmm. psychedelic journey and exploration yeah. into his work but also its ability to reflect in us mm -hmm. attributes that that hold um, some level of resonance and uh it's what he does often he is he is one who likes dialogue and likes conversation and yes. for, for decades now he hosts weekly conversations with individuals not unlike ourselves who want to learn from him want to put forth ideas that yeah. can collectively be you know massaged or articulated yeah. in a way that can that can bring up meaning yeah he's had a he's had a study group there for over 25 yeah. years every week for 25 years which is just like wow and so clearly this man, this, this man is multi-faceted in in his artistic expressions mm -hmm. but all that to say all that to give the context uh for the conversation that we have with him and uh we spend you know a couple hours it's a traditional length of time with the medicine uh podcast interview but we jump right into it yeah we get right into it with lee because he has so much to offer we sort of skipped the who are you what's your background type of yeah. uh questioning and have included it in this intro um but we just get right into the conversation yeah we we do what's called a hot open and it is a hot open so we we didn't want to waste any time and I think you guys will really enjoy the conversation. It was definitely a stretchy conversation and interview for us, meaning his mind is so different than anyone we've ever spoken to that you really need to be like firing on all cylinders to to like keep up with him. And I I love those guests. You know, it's challenging us uh, not only as as hosts of the podcast but also as people who are willingly learning from this person. He is a true wise elder. 
And he has so much studied experience and then lived experience through his expression of art. Definitely, definitely, if you're listening, definitely go back and check out the YouTube at some point so that you can yeah. see what we're talking about. Um, and it's it's almost like taking a picture of a sunset. You know, if you video right. a sunset or take a picture of a sunset and then you're looking at it too, you're like, dang it. It doesn't quite do it justice, um, sh- but you'll you'll get the idea. And uh, so, yeah, we just we invite you to stay open and just absorb. Um, you might find yourself being stumped by some of the bigger concepts that he dives into. But I think this type of uh, education and information, there's something about it that is like resonant, where you might not be able to teach it back to someone else right next to you, but there's something about it that just lands in you and you can feel some morsel of truth like landing in your heart. Lee speaks in poetry. Mm -hmm. His articulation of his thoughts is like music um it's not unlike reading or listening to shakespeare Mm -hmm. where the language is is poetic and artistic and you may not be able to turn to your friend and repeat what you just heard but you know that what you heard was felt Mm -hmm. and that there was meaning from it and that's what i encourage anybody about to listen to these next uh the next hour and a half or so of conversation with lee to do is to sit there and surrender to the art quite literally in the form that that we were able to witness in his home but also to the art form that is lee's ability to communicate these very very complex high level themes and archetypes into into the english language that we can take and do something with yeah. and uh so i just i just ask everybody to to jump into this vortex with us mm-hmm. um whether you do it now or later jump onto youtube um, i say that because you'll be able to see the episode uh, and all of the art that we're referencing as well as engage with us you know podcast platforms don't have a comment section and we want to point people towards youtube even if you listen to the audio and only go back to use the comments but to engage with us because we're going to do yeah. a great job of engaging with any comment or question that's put forth on the youtube video so yeah we always want to hear from you guys without further ado i am so honored to welcome our guest lee mccloskey and we get right into it let's jump in what do you wish humanity valued more themselves one can argue that one of the great sadnesses of our time is meaninglessness And if you feel meaningless, it's because you don't feel there's anything of real value inside of yourself. And and I think if I had to generalize, I would say, I would say it's, it's the knowledge now of how do we address who and what we are and why do we ask the questions we ask. So I think that, yeah, it's themselves ultimately. That's the, that's the answer, Mm -hmm. not the answer, but the (laughs) the suggestion. Mm. Yeah. I love that. It's, um, because it, the way that we see the world is also sort of reflective or rather how we see ourselves is reflective of how we see and interact with the world and others around us. It, I don't think that they can be separate, right? No, if you think, a lot of my work has to do with the realization that we are holographic, meaning that there's no there there in a hologram. And that if we begin to recognize, I was quote, Walt Whitman, who wrote that for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. And if we begin to understand the energetic nature, the atomic nature, then there really is no separation between myself and this chair. There are boundaries, but it's energy. And this is one of the things that I always use a theater uh, proposition, which is that when we begin to understand that there is a play, and that we're characters in a play, meaning our characters are different from one another, but they're each uniquely important to the larger conversation going on, we have a sense of context. And this also allows ourselves to understand relationship of why oftentimes we're, we have a blind side or we have a relationship with a partner where uh, they point something out. And it's that essentially to say that you are always in a state of, of uh, discovery, always in a state of, you're not finishing anything. You're always in a state of, in a sense, exploration and expectation. And that we're at a point now 
where we have spent so long, thousands of years, on the unique ego of the individual, the isolated self, the isolated character. And the place we're at now is that question of the play, meaning what am I participating in? I've been this lone actor having no sense of what the point is. And that's why a lot of the, the narrative here has to do with art, community, the recognition that um, we must come together and inspire each other. My father was an artist and he was one of the founders of the Malibu Art Association. And he would always, he really just brought home to me and, I, and I've continued the tradition which is that that imaginative, creative, just people essentially have to get together and inspire each other. Mm. You know, not critique each other. Mm -hmm. Because the question now is, well, when you leave a gathering, are you exhausted or mm. are you energized? Mm -hmm. Because if you're energized, then essentially you're building toward a greater sense that any performance, like a musician, or an actor, I am as good as the person I am generous with in terms of if I'm leaning into the rift as a, a riff as a musician, then I listen to you, I lean with you, we lean together. Same thing with acting, same thing with dancing, same thing, we would argue really about the more interesting side of being human. It's always relational, it's not isolated. And we're isolated because we forgot that we must be that which brings to the story the sense of a narrative that includes us. And you could argue that we've been trained by narratives that say, you don't matter. Mm -hmm. No wonder people are having such meaninglessness uh, experiences. In this little cup, I have my favorite way to enjoy mushy love, which is in combination with cold milk. We drink raw cow's milk, and I put it uh, about eight ounces of milk in with about a scoop and a half of mushy love that combination like the cold version of mushy love tastes like liquid graham crackers like i shit you not and if you don't know yet what mushy love is it's our mushroom elixir with 500 milligrams of chaga which is amazing for gut support they call it the king of mushrooms and then 500 milligrams as well of tremella mushroom which is the beauty mushroom and she is most known for holding 500 times her weight in water the more hydrated we are the more plump and dewy and fresh and young our skin looks mm, plump and dewy <laughs> For Mushy Love, go to getmushylove.com and you can use the code MEDICINE for a nice little discount that we only give to our Medicine Podcast listeners. What comes up for me, and, and you hit it right on the head as we open the, the, with the first question, is we are valuable. We have value. And to participate in this play, as you so beautifully put it, would be to feel as if what we have to bring towards the play is worthy of being there. And I think that as we have not realized our value in this play, the easy default would be to begin to hate uh, in place of knowing that we can be involved in this, in this grand experiment, if you will. Yeah, this relationship of knowing what we hate and forgetting what we love. I think that that's why when we begin to understand that what we're going through personally, going through collectively, is a very deep examination of, well, what do you love? What matters mm. to you? Are you honoring the things that matter to you? Are you arguing about things that aren't even your own story? There's somebody else's anger that you've adopted as your own. Because much of this, you could argue, is a mental martial art. Uh, because every sacred text, every ancient text, every, uh, in a sense, ma uh, martial art text is, what are you paying attention to? Because everything is actual, but not everything is real. Are you engaging in fights that are not your own? Don't do that. Do you know, in other words, we start to recognize that, that if things are done for us, there's always the control of another authority. So we're at a time where everyone's saying, I don't trust authority, I don't trust this. Well, that's the time when you begin to say, then who do you trust? And if you only have you, then you must begin with this. I am that, and build from there. Otherwise, we're adopting ideas and beliefs like a garment, and as soon as that garment is out of date, we throw it out and select another one. But we're not 
collectively, I don't believe we're not being given time now mm. to just sort of vacillate, oh, maybe it's this, let me get angry or let me. No, everything that's going on now, anger management, uh, all of it, is about trying to turn us away from this using what we hate as a navigational tool to get through the world. Because essentially what we hate is the outcome of what we are afraid of. Mm. And if we don't feel that there's anything of real value in ourselves, we're afraid of that. Mm. And mm -hmm. therefore we cast a dark shadow on the world and find enemies. Mm. And this is where I do, I feel like it's always going back to the etiquette of energy. How am I using my energies? Am I using them in a way that is generous? And I, and I don't mean generous even with others. I mean generous with myself. Because often the damage that's happened, because we must understand that we've inherited a very traumatized human psyche. And no matter how well you cope or maintain, there's still this underlying emptiness, this, this trauma, the sense of futility, the sense of, well, what's the point then? If we're simply going to repeat the same ageless uh, anguishes, why? Mm. But here we begin to understand in the hieroglyph of the human soul where we're sitting that it's time to reframe what, what and who we think we are and why we're asking the questions we're asking. Because again, if we think of theater and we step back into looking at the larger picture, then you say, well, what's the theater of the human story? You know, what is it that I'm part of? Why, why have we been climbing up this hill only to have it fall back down over and mm. over again? Why in every life have I come in with this great sense of possibility only to find that it is either extinguished, it's not given any room to breathe, and yet it's so important to me. I'm a guardian of something that no one cares about. But the next question is, ah, if no one cares about, maybe it's you that has to care about mm. it. And you see how that just takes us away from waiting to impose upon waiting to change and looking at ourselves as a seed and then questioning ourselves saying, all right, if it begins with me, then what should I pay attention to? Where should I begin my story from? And when I look at the world, not to find out what's wrong with it, but look at it symptomatically as a doctor would, then I realize symptoms are saying in a, in a time of chaos, you must find a way to find health because no one will do it for you. You must. But that's also when we begin to mature. Mom and dad aren't doing it for us. The chariots in the sky aren't showing up. You know, we are alone. What do you do? Well, you get more practical. You look at the people you love. And you say, I'm going to begin with this story. I love these people. So my story is not going to be about what I hate for the world. These people don't deserve that narrative. They deserve a better narrative. And maybe I need to work a little bit harder figure out how I can add some yes, not just a bunch of yikes. <laughs> <laughs> you said that we've inherited, uh, I forget the exact words you used, but we, humanity has inherited um, a traumatic history. Mm -hmm. Is yeah, that what you traumatized, said? Traumatized, yeah. Traumatized, yeah. <laughs> Have we ever not inherited a traumatic, traumatized history? Has that, has that ever not existed it's always existed which helps us understand life as alchemy rather than as as product or as outcome because the alchemy says look have you ever avoided the month of october <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there are simply givens this is that mm -hmm. helps us with the archetypes to understand that when we begin to understand consciousness as an instrument and the keys or the archetypes, the structure, we begin to recognize that, oh, you're given an instrument, I'm given an instrument. The key, so to speak, is you will play it differently than I will. But you're not incomplete. You're given a whole and holy instrument. But the instrument, the DNA, the weave, the coat of many colors to get here, now think about it. Think of the disappointment, not just in one's own life, but amplify that across the ages amplify tragedy do you know amplify everything we're experiencing now and you could say well how could the human even endure that type of psychic pain you know how could you come back from so many impossible tragedies 
this is when I start to sense the heroism of who and what we are. Because I realize that this willingness to endure and this unwillingness to quit tells us not simply about my character as human, but about the human character. And this helps us take history and not blame it, not find out, oh, they did this to those. Of course they did. Because it wasn't about knowing. It was about gathering, taking, insisting, building. If we think about the development of an ego in the last 2,000 years, it had to be based on, I am not that. Hmm. Hmm. I am not you. I am me. But we come full circle. That's why this work is in my home. That's why we're talking, and we've talked before this, about community, is that, that once we return home, we realize we're in this together, but we're all damaged. Because the whole point is, if you could find your way home, what do you do with the self-loathing? What do you do with the unforgivableness and the sins of Adam? You know, what do you do? I mean, I've experienced this, and I, I was very fortunate to find Carla, because I feel that in her love, there was the amelioration of, of something I could not have forgiven myself for. Hmm. And I'm not a bad guy, but I just realized that we're dealing with all of the stories, choices that got us here. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just we can't blame it. And when I was in um, Cambodia in a killing field, and I didn't want to be that we were going to, you know, ended up being let off the bus in this rain, this warm rain, in, in what had been a killing field. And it was a gorgeous garden. But there were millions of dead in the ground that had been slaughtered just brutally, just beyond evil. And what was extraordinary was the, it told me, you are not to grieve, because all you want to do is weep. Mm -hmm. These are not your tears. These do not belong to you. They mm -hmm. belong to the mothers and fathers. They belong to the wives and husbands, the children, the babies. And then it said, do not look into the heart of darkness. You know, it was about, 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 it was not interested in my petty emotions and how deeply anguished I was. It was this, don't, no, that's not interesting. You are not to weep. You are to leave a sentinel. Leave part of yourself. You are to witness. You cannot change this. But you can honor it by not looking away. Mm. Mm. And I feel like that's why there's a library in this home. Those killing fields are in a lot of these different stories. The way we've treated mm. our human brothers and sisters. And we can't sit and righteously go, oh, I'm not one of them. Oh, yes, we are. Mm -hmm. We all are. Yes. And that's where we find forgiveness. Because if we realize we all are. Then the only way we can actually change the human story is by making the story more human. Mm. And this is very important for us. That's what you're doing. I feel this is what we're all trying to do, which is say, why are you agreeing to agree with the story you've been told? <laughs> can you do any better? Mm. And mm -hmm. if you can, what would you bring to the story? And think like a gardener. A gardener isn't trying to grow food for the world. A gardener's trying to create a relationship with nature that allows through that rapport, whether it's flowers or food, or both, to get a sense that what I put in comes back, and that who I am is not just inside of me, but it's what I put my energies into. Mm. And there's a reciprocal element, and I do feel with a lot of the iPhones and a lot of the trapment of cyberspace and AI and all of this, that it is imperative to understand that we are the AI. We're the ancestral intelligence. Mm. We are the mm. a AI. We are the archetypal intelligence. We are the AI. We are the artist intelligence. And all of these, and even the AI, the alien intelligence. And they're all in us. And so, again, the key now is what story are you adopting as your own? Are you ever home? Where do you live? Because, as I said, one of the difficulties was bringing ourselves back home after fa fighting so many dragons. You don't know how to take off the armor. But I think that that's the generosity here. It's saying it's not something big. It's something intimate. It's something loving. It's something that as you sit in a library and you say, God, look at all the wars. Look at all the hate. Look at all the violence. 
But look at all the art. Look at all the beauty. Look at all the music. Look at all the meaning that came out of never knowing why. And then you step off the plane and go, wow. Wow, we're willing to endure until we finally blossom. Mm. And a lot of my work is, if you think from a seed, right, you're compacted in the earth, you're contained, and there it's kind of cozy because you know where things are. <laughs> but then you die to that. Literally, the seed, as St. Paul says, you know, seed does not sprout lest it die. And so it dies, and we then sprout. We change. We move up into the earth, and it's compacted again. And we're in the dark, so we're always, our ego is against, pushing against something, Right. And then we break free of that finally, and we're, then we're growing in the air, but we're reaching and reaching. We don't know why. And then we finally get to the point where we've got a closed fist because we're really surviving the seasons, right? We're budding. But when you're in a bud and you've protected yourself, then if you lose your grip, right, you're going crazy. But the season hits, and suddenly you, you're losing your grip, and you don't know why until finally you fully open and realize this was the time of the blossom. Mm. You, In a sense, the bud cannot know. It feels what the blossom is, but until it opens, it cannot know. That's also the art side of consciousness, mm. because the art side is not a product, as I say. It's our willingness to step into not knowing and to be mentored by it, rather than illustrate something we think we know beforehand. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. How do you know, and you touched on home and, and what you love, how does one know that they're home, and how does one truly know what they love? I think one begins honestly by saying, I don't know. <laughs> you know, not to yeah. have a, but, but I would like, I could use a, creating a character as an actor as an example. You don't know, you know, you're going to play Hamlet. Uh, I don't know if I can do that. Well, let's find out. Um, I don't know Hamlet. Well, you're going to have to learn the lines. Then you're going to have to rehearse. And then you're going to experiment. And then finally you'll find that at a certain point, this Hamlet character will be you. A bit like learning to dance. You know, you go through, you step on your toes, and then suddenly, two days later, you're dancing. And you think, well, how did that happen? Why, you know, what, what went into me that finally allowed me to go from stumbling to dancing? The same thing with our human journey. If we treat ourselves kindly, and this is one of the things I tell people when they come and visit here, I say, look, when you see this art, there's 43 years of my life here. You're not looking at something that happened. I didn't just turn on a light switch. <laughs> you know, it, it's taken a lifetime. Now that's helpful for all of us because it's actually indicative of through art, but to say, look, being human, is a life process because it's not about, as we always say, it's not about outcome, it's not about destination. But if we think it's about blossom, then it would be, you'd say, all right, I would give you a certain criteria. Where do you feel safe? Where can you close the door? Hmm. Where can you turn off technology? Where can you say, at least here, these things matter to me? I will create, maybe it's a corner of a room. Maybe it's just four foot square. I'm going to put everything I love about being human here. Hmm. I'm going to create a place of focus so that as I'm caught away and watching too much news, info news, I'm sorry, it's not news. Um, uh, yeah, too many soap operas. Um, uh, that I'm going to build from where I honor what is sacred. I will not ask anyone permission i will not ask anyone what they think and i tell artist friends of mine now i say look and this applies to many many things never ask someone what they think about your art ask them what your art makes them think mm -hmm. otherwise they'll give you their critique and you don't need that <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> we do the critique for ourselves yeah yeah no doubt so we are in a process now of of beginning to once again ask fundamental questions where do you feel safe where do you where can you close the door where can you say at least this matters to me it doesn't have to matter to you it matters to me and that's enough and if you're not interested this is not going to be our conversation about how you're not interested in order to make sure that if you're not doing something you want everyone else around you to not be mm -hmm. doing it either mm 
because it makes you feel much more satisfied. You see how that psychologically, a lot of times people will offer their critique because unfortunately they're actually keeping themselves from having to face themselves, to overcome their own resistance, their own vulnerability, or oh, what will people think. That's really important, uh, you know, because a lot of times what will people think is big in this damaged, trauma traumatized human mm -hmm. weave that we bear. Mm -hmm. What will they think? That's why a lot of my work here, and I, and I feel why it's been very private for a very long time, was it insisted that it grew away from that other conversation that I experienced as an actor professionally, which was everyone thinks their opinion matters. Uh, do, do you know, it's just, oh, I like it, I don't like it. And, and that can drive somebody very far away from their creative muse. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, they try to be please others, they try to, they, and, and so a lot of it, I, and I think part of our story now is that in an art, in a world where art no longer has relevance, it's a commodity and, it's now that we we really reestablish our relationship with the creative spirit, and I think I would even say to someone that said, "Well, you know, what does that mean?" I would say, "Look, go to a stream bed or you know, out into nature, and don't don't you know, says allow yourself to honor that dialogue in you that's really resistant. Just say, yeah, I honor it, but then cultivate another voice that that says." Okay, I, I agree, this is nonsense and there's no connection to nature. Whatever the cynical side of oneself is going to throw up. Say, thank you. Thank you for that. You're doing a really good job of telling me why it's pointless. But let me add this to the conversation. Let me see what happens. And then we bring, you see, that's like bringing something to a character. We start to add to it. Well, okay, yeah, I can, I can be very cynical. I can see what, but I can also choose to approach it differently. And I think that's what, what the sign of maturation that I see in consciousness going on is that nothing is going to be given to us. We must evolve into, if you want a relationship with consciousness, you must have a relationship, not an entitlement. Mm -hmm. Totally. Mm. Yeah, that's so good. Um, sorry, did I? No, 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 no. Did I? I okay. No, please. Uh, that's so good, having a relationship with consciousness, not an entitlement. And I feel that that deeply, uh, of course, you, that you could take that in so many different, so many different angles and aspects of the human condition and the human experience. But one of them, a really relevant one in 2023, as more research is coming to the surface, um, more people are opening their arms to things like psychedelics um, and plant medicines and I get the sense from some people sometimes that they are feeling entitled to this consciousness, to this higher levels of these higher levels of consciousness, and it's not so much a relationship. And um, I'm just reflecting back to you that that feels so resonant with um, experiences that we've had and um, seeing other people's experiences where they almost have this expectation. Entitlement is a great word for it, where it's like, I was going into this journey or this experience expecting this to happen mm -hmm. and it didn't. And now I'm disappointed. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> and this is just one example, of course, but, um, it is, it is really, I think resonant, not only for people who, um, you know, venture into plant medicine and, and psychedelics of course but this is relevant and and true in you know just the the experience of the everyday everyday person everyday life is wanting it that instant gratification i want this now i need mm -hmm. it now i i if i don't have it now then what 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 good is it um rather than build taking the time to build a relationship mm -hmm. to build a foundation with the thing whatever the thing is and you know there's so many beautiful but also scary parts of this little black box that sits in my pocket all the time and i think the the instant gratification slash entitlement that humanity feels i think in large part to this little black box in our pocket is pretty scary. Yeah, and, and I, I call it the three S's, the spiritual superiority syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, which, yeah, the little black box, the, the, the in your head. 
essentially that's all well and fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not that that's what, but you're right about this instant gratification. That is really a very good attitude if you want to be controlled by others. Because mm. the less time you have cultivating you, the more time you spend being essentially a commodity for them. Consuming. Consuming. Mm. And, and I think that this is why, again, the etiquette of energy, the, the relationship with the martial arts of consciousness now is, yes, if you run away and constantly need to be distracted, you're living on adrenaline. You're living on, on shock. You're living on, and, and even the poet Wordsworth said that, you know, that, that the more an individual needed uh, more and more shock to stimulate their imagination by degree, the less imagination they have. And that's why I'd rather feel like people, when they come, uh, they'll, when we do the walkabout tour here and we do events here, I'll tell them, I said, look, uh, you know, I spent six hours cleaning before you came here. And they're like, well, it's like, it's, it, and they don't, but I'm saying, because what I'm trying to say is that there's a custodial element. It's not just being creative. The creative goes, oh yeah, I'd just like to have the sales out, have the crew take care of it. And, and that's kind of the model of the creative. You know, if you get rich enough, you just have a bunch of people doing it for you. But that's not the relationship with the creative spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, that's in a way a celebritization of it. It's, it's, it's where it's more of an outward model rather than what I'm talking about, which is really reclaiming the inward model of, of the creative spirit, meaning you are, it's not something you have, you are the creative spirit. The reason you live your life as who and what you are is because it's an expression of the creative spirit. So essentially it'd be saying, are you going to connect with this quality of who and what you are? Or are you going to connect to the quality that is you when you look in the mirror or you look in the television or you look at your phone? Because that's reflective. That's not coming from within to we, without. That's coming from out to in. And that's why it'd be like standing next to a mirror, right? And that, that the closer you get, the less distance you have. And the faster things to be, seem to be going. But they're always in this reference to you. Always in this reference of the immediate sense of me. But again, that gets smaller and smaller and smaller and more and more claustrophobic and less and less able to handle the world because there's such fright of leaving that tiny little place. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so surprising is how small people are making themselves. I mean, because at a certain point, it does come down to options. <laughs> it comes down to like, you could uh, kind of breathe into that, that smallness. Do you realize what you've turned the world into, really? It's that uninteresting. It's that afraid of the imagination. But I think only an individual can actually challenge themselves. I don't think you can bring anybody out of a trance. But I think a lot of people are entranced now. Mm -hmm. Media has, and we don't understand, it's even physiological, but that if you have more than 25 stimuli going on simultaneously, you go into a type of suggestive hypnotic state yeah. of consciousness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, we all know that feeling. Like everyone yeah. listening knows what that feeling is. Where you're, you know, just take social media for example, where you're scrolling. You've you've scrolled about you know a mile <laughs> with your thumb, and ten minutes, twenty minutes, whatever time has passed by, and you're like, wait, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> how am I still doing this? And it's like you you recognize that you are in this trance state, and it actually it takes some effort to bring yourself out of it and, and close it down and you know go be in the real world we all know that feeling and so if that's happening on an individual level of course it's happening on a collective level yeah and, and <laughs> that is just a little micro um micro experience of the macro experience right now and um I think it is it is definitely encouraging the 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 smallness and the almost like self imprisonment yeah. that we are that we're feeling um as individuals and then it like you said it bring, it makes your world so small that actually dealing in reality feels almost too it feels like it's outside of our scope of experience or or ability because we've made our world so small well, and coming mm -hmm. all the way back to how we remember our value 
and how we find our value such that we can contribute in a co-creative way to the space. I'm even thinking of, and just the language that you've been using, the blossom, how we fall in love with the blossom and remember the relational aspect of the blossom. We are focused on the yield. We're focused on the bounty, which mm-hmm. is very transactional. It's fixed. And what I, and what I love about finding a relationship with the blossoming of mm-hmm. oneself and one's value is that it is about quality where the expectation based outcome based uh obsession with the yield mm-hmm. is quantity and it's my value is based on its quantification and how much it can be counted or weighed or measured where a blossoming seems more relational and has more of a quality to it such that we are finding or measuring our value by its quality less about its quantity if you will and um just kind of piecing those together it's just uh really really incredible and part of the element here of why i talk about this art being in domestic space in private space in intimate space is that's where we're 24 hours a day with ourselves it's not something we get away from we go to and and I do feel like that's that again the question of well where and what and how do we in a way allow for reality to grow from our condition and not as you say sort of just fall into that that overwhelm of what is reality what is you know it's it's that beginning to I think re-anchor ourselves into well where are we setting off from. Mm-hmm. You know, can we find, because my work with the tarot is a wheel, means wheel. And the same thing with my mandala, work with the Phoenix Rise. That's a wheel as well. And I realize that the point of the wheel, the turning of the wheel, you know, and I even think of the archetypes as pushing the spokes out, all of these processes of pushing out the outer wheel. And that finally we've done that, but now we're on the outer wheel. We're, mm. we're still using time and progress. And as you say, product, you know, what do I have? How can I measure this? And yet imperceptibly, because the world, even you could argue that where people are getting everything, all the houses, are, it's empty. It's like, ugh. You know, it's like, and uh, it's not like this sense of, oh my God, do you see how beautiful? It's almost like, you see how lucky that eye is? Oh my God, he's got a sport, you know, blah. And that's that's what you'd say surface. It's all about optics. It has nothing to do with energy. And I think that's the emptiness of the promise now. It's like you too could have this emptiness, mm-hmm. um, but lots of it. And have your own security because somebody will kidnap your kids or so. You know, it's like you start to do all the math and you think, God, nobody's actually got to be loving it up. I mean, because essentially we're all so far away from the sense of well, where where did we begin the story to begin yeah. with? We began, you could say, in the ancient caves, trying to use story in order to cultivate meaning, and we followed a map of meaning and a narrative that led us now into an age of meaninglessness because mm-hmm. it allows, in a way, this very capricious side of the human nature to operate which is the devourer, meaning that that I want, I call it the disease of more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want more, 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 more. It's, and it's empty, empty, empty. And, and that's why our arts, if they're not used as, oh, I'm an artist, but our arts are used as, no, my love, where I close the door and realize that the questions I asked, I can say this as an artist, the questions I was asking were not what the art world was asking. It was an agreement in the art world, like acting. If you want to be in this art world, we're asking these questions. This is our philosophy. And guess what? If you're not, if you're not on, the, on, on that side of it, bye-bye. You know, not interested in you. We have our own brand of celebrity, just like you actors do, just like you fashion people do. And if you understand that not as, oh, that's terrible, but no, it's business, just the way it is, then actually there's a gift given to the creative being that says, well, I can't, I'm not interested in asking those questions. But if I ask these questions or I write this poetry, I got to realize no one's going to read it. No one's going to say, oh, I got to have more of this. You're going to be alone. But my question is, 
What's your first relationship? Is it with the creative spirit or is it with the mirror? How many people know about you? Mm. And I think that's why this art is what it is. And I think that's what people get is this is a lifetime beginning going back to the tarot this is a completely bastardized a bastard system to a great degree oh why why have you cared about so that had to be sheltered at home mm -hmm. because i wasn't in a world that said oh gosh this is wonderful i mean i i got comments like i a friend an academic friend of mine said lee you're you're so talented but why on earth would you waste your time on such a nonsensical tradition as the tarot mm. he meant it you know, and I realize, of course, now that that is how many people see these things, mm -hmm. which is fine. So I feel like the archaeologist that said, well, I, you know, I realize my neighbors aren't interested, but I am. And I just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper. And I found a resource and a community that would gather saying, yeah, if we don't, if we get together and we're curious, then we create the conditions that allow these energies to gather as well. And going back to what you're saying about people feeling that they need, you know, sort of immediate gratification, there comes a time, and I, and I think this is what the Maya talked about, and this is the time where you will not be able to supply that emptiness mm -hmm. with any amount of stuff. Mm -hmm. You will still feel empty. And that's what we're dealing with. And as a matter of fact, I had a, a winter solstice vision in 2011 and i'd done a ceremony here and I'd, I'd you know it was beautiful and i walked up here and i i was looking at at um the grail i was looking at eve and so like, and and i thought why why does the human being what what is the, what is this pain what's this emptiness what why why is what is this that can never be filled in and it took me to a, a chimney tree, one, a burned out uh, ancient sequoia, standing thousands of feet tall, but it was hollowed out on the inside, but it was still living. And you could see all the way up to the top, like a chimney all the way to the top. And it said, the voice said, well, you see, this, this is the human tree. In ancient times, great fires hollowed out this tree, but it didn't die. And so we kept yearning, kept reaching for the sky, kept hoping if God high enough, it could finally reach God. But there was always this emptiness. There was always this hole at the center of the heart. Like, what's missing? What's... And that created a yearning and a yearning and a yearning. And then it took me up through the top and out through the top. And it asked me a question, which I, I found and still find captivating. It said, is this tree beautiful in and of itself? And I thought, yeah, it's extraordinary. It looked like this twisted, gnarled, Monterey, you know, type of just weathered entity. And it was gorgeous, but, but tortured gorgeous. And I said, yeah, it's beautiful in and of itself. It doesn't need to be more. And then it took me back up to the top of the tree. And it showed me, I looked down and I saw all of these embers, these sparks coming from all different parts of the tree up through that hollowness. And they were coming up through the top of the chimney. Now some were going th up through the top and they were turning into stars. And then others were coming up to the top and there was a vortex that was forming. So there was a, a, a wheel, a vortex. And as it turned at the top of the tree, I noticed in the middle, there was what was a type of golden glowing brain, an orb. Mm. And it said the human being does not yet have a brain. <laughs> if i only had a brain <laughs> <laughs> that 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 we have an operating system and that this hollowness this yearning has created a rugged beauty that without knowing why it still has created great beauty but now what's forming out of all of these different qualities is a type of coherence a brain that will be the human form divine hmm. meaning it will animate the entire system not simply one of us but all of us and that's that's part of the hidden key here which is that there was an mc escher did a beautiful uh, drawing or uh, print of where you see a ribbon and it's a face but it's on a ribbon and that the face is created but the ribbon it's just a ribbon creating the face 
And that was really the feeling I got, that we have a visor and that the ego is that visor. It's that feedback system. It's the, that, I like that, I don't like that. It's the opinion, it's all of that. And that what was happening was that that emptiness can only be filled when we return to where our heart lives, where our soul loves. And we decide that in spite of all appearances, I choose to love mm. and not hate. And as William Blake said, I must create a system of my own or be enslaved by another man's. And the systems that are being offered now are new slaveries. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. It's the only way I can put it. Mm. New slaveries. Unless you liberate yourself, that you are an independent operating system, that you are the human form divine, that you are the outcome, not getting somewhere, the outcome, you are the technology, you will be fodder for another person's. Hmm. Oh, you're not that, and you need this gadget, or you need that machine, or you need this. You don't need it, you need you. Hmm. Getting mm -hmm. back to the first question. Mm -hmm. Incredible. And, and to create art from your lens and not from somebody else's perspective and somebody else's opinion. And, and I think it's worthwhile to take some time as we sit here in uh, the hieroglyph of human souls, this incredible, uh, to use the limited language that we have, library, this art form, this yeah. interactive multi-dimensional experience, the walkabout that you took us through for the last few hours. Listeners, if you're, uh, not aware by now uh, we've been spending hours getting to know lee and and absorbing his wisdom and he's walked us through what what you'll have heard about in the intro and, and likely seen pictures and videos of by now on on youtube or on social um but this just incredible life's work this mm -hmm. organic psychedelic substance this cocoon that we're in today yeah, the painted cave is so <laughs> exactly, perfectly yeah. named and <laughs> it's funny you use that term the the painted cave when you when you came up here before chasing I were just up here by ourselves and I, I said this is like a painted womb it feels like I'm in a womb not only is there what looks like to be the cosmic womb right next to us in, in painted form on the wall but the the entirety of the room feels like a womb a, a cauldron of sorts yeah um, where things are alchemizing and mixing and and you know, we could probably spend a year in here and find new things to look at <laughs> and check out. And yeah, I, I think it's it's good that we that we highlight, yeah, highlight and, that. And, and I think it's worthwhile as we talk about the the real relevance of asking your own questions and mm -hmm. in, in the in the art form that that you know you've taken up. It's been you know questions that maybe uh, wouldn't aren't aren't posed for others in the quote unquote art space. Mm -hmm. And so if you could walk us through a little bit of, of the origin story here, and, and you've shared with us here in the last few hours what that's looked like for you, but what was the time, what was the setting, what were those questions that you were asking that birthed this uh, organic, psychedelic, divine cocoon that we're in? <laughs> the, <laughs> the unintentional womb. <laughs> um, but if you think about going to that revelation of the womb, of the even the, what was called the Buddha womb, this idea of the womb of wisdom, is where the art, where we're held in a larger story that keeps us all realizing that that you can look at any part and they're all different parts of a much greater conversation so we have this this creative womb that i i feel is is key to and i write about this in the hermit uh, because it's about virginal about the womb and it's it's the story that that our brain our mind our heart every part of us is a womb meaning that we plant seeds and whatever we repeat, whatever we dwell upon, whatever we water, becomes our, our reality, so mm. to speak. And walking through this, uh, just because it's so much, I would say that, that the revelation for me has been that for many, many years, like I had a 25 years of a theosophy discussion group here every Tuesday night, and to balance that, we read Jung's Red Book, we read wow. uh, Western Inner Traditions, we read William Blake. I mean, it was always to really realize that our world was not offering up Emerson, it wasn't offering up really these incredible 
thinkers that weren't about follow this new spiritual path, but really, no, go to nature. I want you to recognize that, that if you do not have philosophia, meaning the love of wisdom, then essentially you're building a house on a false foundation mm -hmm. because you're not beginning with life, you're beginning with concept. And so that premise, I realized that going back to 1981, I began to open my doors because I was also working as an actor. Well, as an actor, I was, I was able to move here because I was working on a show, Dallas, which was very popular. And that also taught me about the cultural conversation, about celebrity, about what people think they want, and also the conversations of industry where it's about work, about this, that. And recognizing a bit, and I, I think people do in disciplines where you realize I can't just talk to the people that are in my business. I gotta, because I've got to somehow bring something to that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's like doctors just say, I can't keep talking medicine. I've got to talk art. You know, <laughs> right. it's like, yeah. you yeah. know, it's like, and, and I think that that's very important because it lets you. And, and for me, what I love pointing out to people is like, none of this was a, a grand conceited and go, no, I'm going to, you know, it's like, no, I just, I was given, I realized. I always realized I was given gifts. Like I realized as an actor, I was given the gift of time. I had this dressing room. I thought, I mean, so much of my artwork was, I had a lot of time. Mm. I was able to use it and I used it as a study hall. I literally bring my books. I bring it, you know, I didn't, wow. I didn't just wait to go home to do it. I, I said, okay, what are my gifts? I've given, I've been given the gift of time. My friends that had to work nine to five and then they're exhausted. And then they're, you know, they want to have a beer. They don't want to sit in paint. They're like, I, I, the painter in me is going, I have no time. I'm so exhausted by the end of the week. I just want to turn on the television, <laughs> you know, and I understand that. I think this, so that was a gift. And also the other gift was the, this gift of an acting career that allowed me in a way to take my, my beating creatively, <laughs> publicly in that regard. I mean, in other words, that you're really beholden to the, I, I liken it to you put your, your canoe in the, you know, sort of in the, the main mm -hmm. river and you start rowing. And it's really up to the river itself whether you're going to get into that main current or whether it's going to keep sort of bouncing you across. And I thought for me it was keeping kept me uh, closer to the shore. But because of that, I realized my frustration with Dallas is I started to realize because people say, oh, it's so successful. I thought, I, it's not that I'm biting the hand that feeds me. It's just that this was not success. I thought this popularity, mm -hmm. but it wasn't. It w didn't mean anything to me. You know, it's like somebody said, oh, do you know how many people watched the wedding of you and Lucy? It was like, oh, million. I said, no, I know my mom watched it, my dad watched it, you know, my family. It was like, by the time, you know, like we really don't understand uh, this this vast numbers. I mean, you know, it's like, like I don't know. I, I know what affects. And, and so that opportunity, though, to move here, to live here, was when I started opening my house and I said, well, let's, and I started with um, uh, work with um, my cat. That's my cat coming Hello. in. <laughs> Hello, Hello, Alfred. I'm in heaven right <laughs> yes, now. Yes, There's yes. A, a kitty next to me and I'm just in absolute <laughs> heaven. <laughs> yes, yes. So we've got a cat house. Um, you have a deep, con deep conversation and a kitty on my right, lap. Right. Oh yeah. my God. Oh. And you're like, uh, okay, I'll spend the night. <laughs> I'll tell you, after my own heart. That's actually, I, I say um, I've had many of my best conversations with just me and the cats. Yeah, yeah I get it. <laughs> the, yeah. Uh, but what that did was that I realized that that acting for me, w w I would make my patron. You know, I felt grateful that I was able to make a living. But I realized that to a certain degree, it wasn't. It was not going. It was what it was. You know, and, and but it allowed me to to open my home. And what I think is so remarkable is I never thought the art would lead into anything. I never thought. It was just the way I asked questions. You know, I had started using art as a way of asking questions when I was in New York uh, at Juilliard to connect with character. Because my dad would say, when you can't talk about something, paint it. So I, my dad was the painter. I wasn't. I was an actor. So I thought, well, okay, I'll use these tools, though. And I love that I entered painting that way because it was far more indigenous or Eastern, meaning that it wasn't that I was going to optically try and make a chair look like a chair. I was beginning with the energy. It was more like Jackson Pollock. I was beginning with raw force because I was trying to find anger. When I started mm. working with pigment, mm. I was just throwing it at the canvas. I was like ah, hitting the canvas because I said I, I felt like I was sort of wrapped in plastic. I felt like, why can't I find 
direct connection and and that's when the 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 art became therapeutic because i i bit big uh, pieces you know big pads mm. and i wasn't worried about being an artist it's the other thing you take back you close the door this is an experiment it's like a rehearsal it's not a performance i don't want your opinion of of a rehearsal you know i don't want your opinion that's what i needed to protect because i realized how vulnerable the creative soul is mm. you know and and so a lot of that though the the fierceness the ang it it all added to this realization that with the theosophy meetings with the the um, uh, looking at um, a western inner tradition all of these different um questions that that then led into my work on the tarot and then the the tarot became so that was being cultivated and as a matter of fact on thursday night i was able to read my rough draft hear everyone's comments go back and rewrite it reread it with this group of people so it's very aquarian it comes out of this dialogue of like do you understand what this is saying it's mm -hmm. like so the book why the book is so good is it answers the questions you know if something's stated it's like well what would that mean and then it's and and that really did come out of this this um remarkable development of the tarot now that's downstairs and why as this unfolds it unfolds with a theater story meaning that part of the mythic structure of our story is to realize that there's a story. You know, it's not just, oh, weird, psychedelic things happened. You know, I took this and I was like, oh, this is crazy. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, there's an underlying weave here. Yeah. There's, there's literally, there are, and one of the great things here is we've mapped the hieroglyph of the human soul, Matthew, Dr. Bennett and I, um, and really are applying it to psychological personality disorder about the quadrants about about how do we make sense of ourselves how do we use the immersive nature of this art to experience it directly to not have to use words but to use environment like a labyrinth so that the body goes oh i'm picking up a different way of putting myself together than just having to figure things out so just in terms of the the art the, the journey here has helped me understand as the tarot did that many of the things that took many many months many years to create individually all found a place they all became part of a larger context that ultimately had nothing to do with time do you know time was being used to draw them forth literally in this case to draw them forth and that that when they were and that's what happened when i finished the tarot actually i i had every drawing i thought oh god because I, I was intimidating myself i thought what do i do now <laughs> and, and and but when when it came full circle it was like suddenly all of that time evaporated and it was like plugging in a plug it just turned on and i went oh that's right this wheel we've been on now think of the archetypes because that's really not the artist that's that's a much deeper that's coming through the artist because that's saying this story of the archetypes returning home as they do here at Olandar was the story of the 20th century mm. because that's all 20th century work meaning that and that's black and white like the keys of the piano meaning the black and white of things the keys of consciousness the difference between the characters of this that that we'd examine that you think of the 20th century it was the deconstruction of everything break everything down look at everything deconstruct but then we're left, and this is what the room is about, that, that when this begins then on 9-11-2001, much to my surprise that it turns into this, it was this like Humpty Dumpty. We had fallen off the wall. And as a matter of fact, a great deal of the initiating dialogue was with this Picasso-like this, uh, Picasso mother uh, figure that, that begins to say that Picasso in this narrative represented the 20th century perfectly because he took the feminine and cut her up like la dame de d'avignon you know he breaks up space he takes the african archetype and he severs it from its context so essentially it's like psychology we break things down but we don't contextualize them we're too busy exploring whoa what happens here <laughs> you know we're breaking it but by the time of the end of the 20th century we're literally on our knees we literally don't have any meaning. Like Jackson Pollock taking art to the floor, right? That's the collapse of Western art, really. It's the end of, of a great journey of, of, of getting into a greater and greater vision until it finally collapses. 
And again, from the 50s onward, I mean, the 60s onward, we're left with personal discovery. We're left with art of social reflection, of, of social critique, of journalism. But we've moved away from, to a great degree, art as having relevance to the larger collective. So therefore, art will be entertainment, and we will be entertained into submission. And because art was always where it was meant to upset the status quo, even if it was to upset it that how can this be so beautiful and still be human? Do you know? And that's mm -hmm. important because we don't think about that. We're usually thinking about how marvelous our ugliness is as mm -hmm. a species rather than how remarkable our Beethovens are, mm -hmm. our Gustav Klimt's are, dear Michelangelo's. I mean, I just, I just feel we have such a richness that is obscured over and over again. Um, but then when we look at, well, why would it be? And I'm convinced it's because it's been pushing us back to our center. Mm. When the world betrays you, do not betray yourself. Hmm. Don't follow suit. And that's what happens so often. Oh, that's such a beautiful point. Because when we are betrayed externally, the last thing we think of is doubling down on our own trust of oneself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's usually a twofold death. Mm. We are betrayed by something and then we betray ourselves. Mm. And, and, I, and I feel like that's why much of what's going on individually and collectively is a process of maturation. When you do realize that to survive, you can't wait for another. You can't wait for a better story. You are the better story. You're the one that must say, I choose to tell the story I can live with. I choose to open my heart. This is one of the things I find very with your podcast. People are doing this. I call it the autoimmune reaction. <laughs> this is how we heal. We heal with story. We heal by offering opportunity to one another, say, yeah, we can get together and cynically reduce the world to ashes. It's easy. Let's do the more difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, let's follow Spinoza. Who I love the, the, the quote that, for all things noble are as difficult as they are rare. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but we as human, we are that rarity. Yeah. Every human being potentially is. But we must step up to the plate. It's like having a relationship with another person and saying, honey, just get me stuff. Do everything for me. I don't want to do anything for you. No, 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 you do it. And this is really the parental problem we're having with consciousness. This, this uh, you know, I want everything done like that. Mm -hmm. um, these energies are like, no, uh-uh. Doesn't happen that way. And if you're not willing to show up, if you're not willing to understand that, like, hey, you want a good physique, you gotta go to the gym. Yeah. You gotta you gotta watch your diet. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just gonna sit and eat and talk about why on earth you can't get a good physique. Right. You're not taking the steps. Right. And the steps are there. And I think this is the other element about the feminine. It's like take out the garbage. In other words, stop being on your high horse thinking what you're all about matters to anyone it doesn't that's what i've learned in a way in a soul crushing way at certain times i'm going god i thought that, no it has to matter to you because that's the story now that the accolades the this the that and the other thing that people think they want let me tell you if you get ten thousand likes ah oh, it's not eleven thousand yeah, yeah. Get fifteen thousand. Oh man, and not eighteen thousand. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You know. Well, and, and same with you, you mentioned the aesthetic. Physically, we can we may get to the weight we want by starving ourselves, but we're going to be sick and dying in the process. Yeah. But what unhealth yes. have you created along the way? Or we can learn to fall in love with the process of getting to know our bodies and how our body responds positively to movement and, and listening to, and, and to the mm -hmm. inputs that listening we that we give feedback. it through food. Yeah. And um, you'll realize that, you know, the old cliche, it's about the journey, right? It's not about the outcome. At th that that phys physique and that aesthetic that you were aiming to obtain uh, was only maybe just the, the initial spark to get you to fall in love with the process, in love with the experience yeah. of finding health. Yeah, if you think about this being offered 
there's a love affair. It's your soul <laughs> and it's you. And your soul is not asking for much, but a little empathy. Right. A little out of girl, out of boy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know, because we have to, this is one of the great keys here about, you know, you asked about the narrative here, that the narrative here began in the hieroglyph as, as an arc, as told to, to build an arc, not an arc. <laughs> but it was not, it said not to navigate the physical waters, but the mental waters, because our narrative as human has become weak. And this is what cancer is. Cancer is when the cell reads, when it replicates, as it always does. It loses its um, clarity until finally a cancer cell then is, it, it just forms itself, doesn't know its footprint, and then for, starts to think it's the host body and attacks mm. the body. And I thought that's a metaphor of our time. We've lost our footprint. Mm. We've lost why being human matters, why we're a noble species. And that's what triggered this, because on 9-11, when those towers came down, I looked at my daughters and my wife, and I said, I'm going to tell you a story of why being human matters, why this is noble. And regardless of the darkness, it's not about the darkness. Mm -hmm. Never has been. It's the catalyst by which we choose to say, if the light will emerge, we must be the responsible custodians for that light. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we can't be angry at the people who bring us flashlights and call it light. Mm. Do you know, I, I really do. I think that the, this is about, what I think of as the feminine is the return to responsibility, meaning that love is not a given. It is something that you seek to become worthy of. Mm. You don't take. You're not entitled. And if you think you are, you are alone. Mm. And the more you do it, the more alone you become. This is very, I mean, do you see, this is an etiquette of energy. I'm not talking about beliefs here. I'm talking about the way energy works. That what we put into this energy, we get back tenfold. I know somebody else said that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why part of the, the structure here is first technology. It's paint and storytelling. But we must remember that, that, that paint, that when something manifests, this is breath. This is love. This is manifestation. It's not concept. And it's beautiful. So do you see like a blossom? Suddenly it's holding values that aren't optical. They're inherent. Mm -hmm. This is important for us now because it's not the optics we're after. It's the energy. And it's, the, it's that sense of where can I turn off technology? Where can I close the door? Where can I say this matters to me? And it doesn't have to be big. It has to be intimate. And I have to tell this universe, I love her mm -hmm. or him, mm -hmm. whatever. You know, do you know, in other words, because that's what cultivates relationship. Yeah. If we don't say it, why on earth do we? And this is one of the great energies here. It says, tell people to give me material to work with. And that's why the theater is very developed now here. Because as above, so below. The book of Thoth below. Thoth's library above. Meaning that that the quest from ancient times, and we can look at the, the, uh, the obelisk as a great example. The obelisk upright is an antenna. It's about oneness. There's no division. The question, though, is that in that consciousness, we are connected to the stars, but we also, it's not about discovering what's uniquely within the individual. We all know, and so we are honoring this greater so the question was knocking over the obelisk, a bit like Moses leaving Egypt. You say, why does he get lost in the desert for 40 years? And you think, well, anytime there's 40, it's a cycle. But it's also the beginning of the development of God's not here. You're not directly aligned. The obelisk has fallen over. There's a journey that must be had. You must take this journey. So if we think of the development of the ego not as a monstrous thing, but actually as this journey, I begin by being lost. You asked, how do you begin? Well, <laughs> you see, you have this feeling you once knew. <laughs> and then you went into this desert <laughs> and you said, follow me. And you went, I hope they're not really following me because <laughs> I'm lost. Um, but, you know, you think of, of even the, the sort of the infancy of the ego, meaning we're lost. We need a guide. We need Moses. We need a father. You know, we need somebody. <laughs> are there any commandments we should know about right. anything? We uh, just basic tenets. Um, and, and so we're developing that. And then, you know, I say then Christ comes along and says, you are uniquely worthy of salvation. You of your own accord are mm -hmm. uniquely noble. 
So we have this journey of, of trying to assimilate the, the unique worthiness of the self, the, in a way, the, the commandments of self, you know, the, the sense of our connection to the larger community, but then also the connection to the, the mystical heart, meaning what I bring to the community is forgiveness. It's empathy. It's this this quality that sees in one another. This Christos, this relationship. It helps us understand why we would finally go through all of these religions. Not that they're wrong, or that, but they're they're a beautiful expression of that which, like every life, lives a certain. Like I, I really feel the Christian ethos. It's zenith. Zenith was the Gothic, the Gothic cathedrals, Notre Dame and Shout, and I could. That's another conversation. But, but it it just it's like things rise and then they go back, like with the dome of Saint Peter, to the law, to you're smaller. I am authority. You're not the authority. But this is all in the development of the ego. Do you see? So that's what I do. I feel like this is a key that now, and it's it's not forty days, forty nights, but forty three years, forty. You know. Mm -hmm of people gathering, creating focus, coherence, for what happens, finally, this manifestation of art or creation, because that's the language of creation, reveals itself as a womb, meaning that, that now I can hold you. I'm a library. And as the librarian, I don't care. You can read any authors you want. You can believe anything you want. It's all here. You don't have to fight over the books. And if some of them are on fire, maybe close the book and put it back on the shelf. You know, we start to see that. And that's why, again, the mother returns in the hieroglyph, the sense of Sophia, the sense of, of being naked with her, meaning that, that this is the point where there's no armor. And as a matter of fact, with the tarot, I, I remember after 17 years, I was writing my journal and I, I wrote down, I... I, I um, I, I give my sword uh, and, ret and return it for a lantern. And so I was given a lantern. But then I, I reached these doors, and they were like the baptistry doors in, in, you know, in, in uh, at, uh, Florence. And I, and I touched them because of this work uh, that I'd done. And I thought it was about what I'd done, but as I touched the work, it opened the door. And I went, oh, it wasn't about that. And then I was mm -hmm. met by a beautiful female figure, and I and I had this suit of armor on that was also beautiful that I'd created, you know, like this this great thing. And she said, "Where are you going now? You will only drown with this on. Mm. Mm. You must take it off." And so I did. And I walked through those doors, and I went, "Oh wow! That's if we think of the symbolism here, that's like walking upstairs, yes, back into the womb of consciousness." going where we're at now we've created these suits of armor and i think that's why a lot of people still are in their suits of armor and they're they're stuck outside the the front door in a sense they can't they but they only they it's and then we can use the wizard of oz right dorothy goes well why didn't you tell me and what's a good way to say because you had to know and i really do think that that's where we're at that's the creative in us mm -hmm. I can't be creative for you. I can't love for you. I can't dance for you. But guess what? You can do all those things. Wow. And you don't have to be good at it. You don't have to sell it. You don't have to make up for somebody. You know, it's like have a have a fun, you know, in other words, turn off turn off the the critical lens. And I think that's why everyone's in such so agonized because the more you critique others, the more you live in the dread of being critiqued. Mhm. Mm because that's the energy you're welcoming. As soon as you say, I hate, there's a whole lot of energy that goes, ha ha, great. Mm -hmm. Come on, jump on board, guys. We're going to yeah. make this a good one. Yeah. And we are lived, not living. And we are played. We're not playing. Mm. <laughs> there's so much there. And we could go in so many different directions. Um, and... You, we've we've talked about tarot a little bit here and there. You've mentioned it a few times, and um, of course, people know from the intro that you've you've drawn and and created this these beautiful not created the archetypes yourself, but created the art be, that that is an expression of the archetype. And I'm curious um, from maybe the the major arcana, the major. Mm -hmm. um, the trumps, right? 
No Trumps, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, what are you seeing when you look out at the story of humanity right now? What are you seeing as one or two very relevant archetypes, major arcana, that is being reflected in humanity or that humanity should be well aware of right now? The two that come to mind immediately, uh, and then I could go out from there, but but the two that come to mind are the tower and the world. Hmm. And there's two very important reasons why, because you said Trumps and Pre President Trump. We have a type of projection of an outward theater that's very mythic at this point. We have to have to get away from what side one is on or what pol politics one has. As a matter of fact, in my discussion groups, I banned politics for the last 43 years. Really, I, yeah. I just, I don't, we don't talk politics or sociology. In other words, we're going to talk with ideas that no matter what your politics are, you'll leave inspired. So whatever we think, when you breathe into it, it expands it. It allows it to not be, you know, in a sense, suffocating. So the archetypes, though, why I say the world, is that one of the great mysteries here and one of the great proofs here, because I always wanted to know, well, how does this archetypal language speak with us? In other words, what, and as an actor, I was very interested because uh, as an actor, you have to develop the ability to talk to yourself. Do you know, because <laughs> mm -hmm. nobody right. can teach you <laughs> anything. You have to go, how is that? So you're asking a question, it's kind of, and, but it, it frees one to have a very strong inner dialogue. Why this is essential is that, that my realization with the world archetype is that, that I redrew this world archetype. It was very Mayan uh, in a way, and it turned to be far more Gothic. And I realized that that um, when I was framing them, I was putting back a frame that my world archetype is dated 9 11, 1986. It's 15 years mm. to the day of the collapsing of the Twin Towers. Well, there are twin pillars in the image, and they collapse essentially the training wheels, the binary of money and God, these false erections that collapse. And so the world then becomes the fi the the uh, the archetype of this entire story to a great degree because the world archetype is the twenty first. It's the last numbered card. It's the last of the three sevens, and it brings us full circle because it's like this room. It's saying, "All right, as the world, I'm going to bring you back to manifestation to Saturn." I want you to know why you knocked the obelisk over. I want you to know why Saturn, when you look at the planet from the side, is divided. The mm -hmm. ring divides the below and the above. But when we turn it, it becomes an eye pupil, and we see that it is the eye. This division is this eye that opens us up to the greater universal eye. But we've had to have the divided Saturnian journey. So why the world then becomes so fascinating, the 9-11 then triggers this, the hieroglyph of the human soul, on 9-11-2001. And now 22 years later, like the 22 major arcana, we once again come full circle. And so I feel that, that the, the world archetype has to do with the knowledge of the imagination as key to the structure of form, meaning as we think, so we create. And that the binary of the world was this false erection, you know, it says higher and higher, I have more money, more money, more God, more God, be obedient. But these are false erections of, of outward authority. And here they collapse, they bring us back into intimate space, essentially saying not what do I have, but what do I make? of all of this that's been lost. Mm. Where do I create context? And part of that structure then of the world, because if you think of that as finally creating the form that can hold the content, that's a very important because that's also why this is my home. Think of a narrative through art that said, I need to put you in the picture. I need it to be a place that as this painting is painted on linoleum, that's painted on the ordinary because this is the story of the human. We are only ordinary is how we feel. But the gift here of the art is saying that's beautiful because now as ordinary, you don't have to defend all of the gods and dragons. You don't have to fight these battles anymore. 
you have to, like that blossom, like that bud, begin to say, well, where can I open? Where can I have the sense that this opening won't be up for judgment? Like you wouldn't put a flower out in the road. You know, you would be intimate with it. And if you became confident, you'd share it. But you wouldn't make that your first uh, stop. You know, and this, this is something that, that more and more I just find myself looking at and wondering about with the archetypes that the other archetype I go to is the tower archetype. And why this is so important is that with Trump, the, the archetypes are called Trumps. <laughs> and I, a little backstory, as an actor, I played a character I modeled after Donald Trump in the 90s. Um, I played Damien Smith on General Hospital. I played the son of a gangster. And, and I said that, uh, that I was the one that, that said everybody has their price. What's yours? You know, <laughs> if you don't believe you have a price, I'll find yours. Mm. <laughs> you know, I'm not interested in good or bad. I'm interested in the fact that if, are you on my team? That's really how he was. That's what I learned from this guy. But what's interesting about the Trump Tower and why it affects us is that, that the world archetypes, the Twin Towers fall. <laughs> we live in the age of Viagra. We live in the age of false erections. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm angry enough, I'll keep it hard, honey. <laughs> well said, well said. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I really found that I, I had to laugh because I thought, I thought when, when, when the Trump was played, I thought it's, he even has the Trump Tower. And I thought, okay, and he's orange. <laughs> and it's the planet Mars. And Mars sets everything on fire. And it's a fire that doesn't allow a return mm. to what was before. Do you see? So, so this is where the mythic underpinnings are like, whoa, okay. Then we're really experiencing archetype. You know, the, sort of Johnny One note, you know, anger, 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 anger. But if you think of one note on the piano, that would be the key, right? right? So the question is then, then in the intimate element here, if the world and the tower, if Mars and, and anger are, in a sense, throughout the human condition, and if the world archetype is going through a collapse of a binary belief system and having to recreate it from the ground up, mm -hmm. as we do here, right, then this is actually saying that guess what? The key to who we are, if the art is an indicator, which it is, is an intimate space. It's the place you're not looking. It's where you love. And people are so busy hating at this point that that's the loudest noise. And that's part of the martial art here, the, the mental element. Oh, okay. Then I won't draw my sword for that argument. I've got too much to do here. I want to go to market, got to pick up my kids. You know, and I do think that that practical side is, you know, who has time mm -hmm. to, you know, it's, it's getting over this sort of iPhone warrior stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, you know, who cares? Uh, I, I really feel that the whole point of where we're at is the generosity of forgiveness, not simply for others, but for oneself can begin to heal from within to without. Because the optics will not change unless the energy changes. And the energy that got us here, this grand generalization of the Piscean Age and Messiahs, is over. It's like we've hit the mainland, like a big ship. Mm -hmm. We've hit the coast. So now how do we get into the rivulets? How do we get up? How do we get into, into the land? Well, we're going to need a smaller boat for that. Maybe an intimate boat, maybe a boat just for one or two. But we'll find our way in. And when we do, we'll begin to develop stories that, yeah, we're part of that crossing, but we know we're not crossing anymore. So when you tell me that generally people are like that, I'll say, you know what? Those were the old days. General is fine. But give me specifics. Because when I look specifically, I realize every human being is struggling with very basic questions. And a lot of them have to do with what do we do mm -hmm. to cultivate meaning? I will not let anger define the story of who and what I am. I've come too long and hard 
to make that my story. And that's, I think, what I rejected on 2001. Something in me quit. Mm. I said, if this is the lack of imagination masquerading as reality, I quit. I didn't realize it would lead to this, but... It, you know, but it wasn't. It wasn't quitting the world. I still paid my bills. But, yeah. You know, I, but it was. I quit agreeing to agree with that narrative mm-hmm. that it always ends in flames. Do you know? I always say no. That's the alchemical fire. The, the flames aren't the key. The transmutation is, and that's why we're surrounded by by the arts. You know, the, the artists. I'm convinced that they tell us. Look, in every age, we were ignored. We were only as valuable as the Duke thought we were valuable. Mm-hmm. We were only, you know, we were expendable. Nobody cared. So when you mope around that nobody cares, well, nobody ever cared. And realize what we had to realize, that I have to care. Mm-hmm. Why am I waiting for guardians or custodians when I am a guardian or a custodian? Think of how your soul is dealing with that, right? It's you. That's why I have people sit in the mirror of self-reflection. I say, everything in this work, in this beauty, in this trans, you know, because it becomes multidimensional with 3D glasses, is saying, I, you are the key. You are being put back in the picture because for thousands of years you've been convinced it's not you. Mm-hmm. For thousands of years it said, you don't matter. Your wisdom doesn't matter. Where you live doesn't matter. What you love doesn't matter. Who you are doesn't matter. And this is the Aquarian reclaiming, oh yes it does. And if I'm a jazz musician, maybe I play the sax and maybe you play the guitar. And I'm not going to tell you as a saxophonist how you should play your instrument. (laughs) But when we get together, we are going to play. And that's what I know. I know that, that it's a matter of giving ourselves permission to say, because I even have a mantra, there's no reality, only probability. I choose this one. Because if there's an infinite probability, like Schrodinger's cat, right? Yeah, it could be dead, could be alive. And I've used this with my own cats. I choose the one where they're alive. Mm -hmm. I do, because my fear and panic goes into, (gasps) and I go, back up, back up. I choose. And this is where we start to use our own energies. We don't try to become wizards and go, every time I snap my fingers, the signal turns green. But I tell you, if you start experimenting with things like that and don't take it highfalutinly, so to speak, you'd be amazed at how interactive the world really is. Mm. It really is. This is why people are having a lot of synchronicities. I say you're starting to hear the real language. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because Mm -hmm. what's the first thing silenced in love uh, when you don't love? The poetic, the ambient, the soft focus. Everything has to be hard focus, literal. Yep. You know, you have to hold on to control it. And I think that we're going through a, through a, a, a birth process now. I, I think because the condition, and I tell people that we're not born because we want to leave the womb. We're forced to leave the womb because the womb itself becomes toxic. Mm-hmm. So think of the world womb ejecting us into this womb with a view. <laughs> but it's returning us back to first technology, the painted cave. But we left that painted cave when it was empty. We left having to tell every generation why it mattered, to create context, to create meaning. So we've been the cultivators of meaning. Our arts have been the byproduct of not going mad, not being decorative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I I mean, we, uh, there's a fierceness that's, to a certain degree, been betrayed by anger. Mm Mm-hmm. Fierceness has nothing to do with anything being at your expense. It's the fierceness of standing in the middle of a fire with your roots firmly planted, mm. understanding that there's nowhere to go. So it's not to attack the fire, it's to trust what you bring to the deeper nature of things. And that is, how do you focus with your mind? But not just your mind, how do you focus with your energy body? How do you feel, right? How do you allow yourself, do you give yourself permission? And, and I think that this is why everything Think of a discovery process that said, if I didn't demand these questions from you, they'd be an entitlement. But because you're earning them, and this is why I always quote uh, Rilke from the Duino Elegies, and I love this quote, he said that, that you, you can't impress 
the angels with your grand emotions. In the cosmos, you're just a beginner. <laughs> so tell him of some word you've earned. Mm. And I look around at this human condition, and I say, we've earned this human story. And the human condition is always anguish and difficulty. But the human condition always is. In spite of that, that will not be our story. In spite of the rain, that's what I said about the Irish, in spite of the rain, in spite of everything being against you seemingly, you still sing, you still drink, tell some lies, get yeah. together with friends. And at the end of the evening, the rain's still raining, but you walk out, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. And that's what I'm looking for with the creative spirit. It's like, yeah, things are what they are. It's a season. But they don't define you. They teach you to be a navigator of it. And that's why this sense of let us become modern Noahs. Let us each build an ark of consciousness. But let it be built from what matters to you. And what matters to you is different than what matters to me. That's the beauty of our unique human experience and story. That's the beauty of a library. You look at those names and you say, my God, that was a life. But it was so different from that life and that life and that life. But they're all spines, right? They're all uniquely true and beautiful. And that's why I get this feeling like why this is a womb as we're sitting in a library as well. That's saying, and the mother's saying, I'm the knowledge of your atoms. There are no evil atoms. I love you. Tell a story you can live with. Tell a story that begins with where you feel safe. And if you only had a few hours, a few days, what would you be paying attention to? Because there's no guarantees in this world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There just aren't. And I think that the more we allow that preciousness, because I think that's part of the great stimulant here, is the more we're not overcome by uh, fear of death, the more we recognize the preciousness of death. Because then if it's not forever, then what is this time for, mm -hmm. right? What is mm -hmm. this time for? This is the time to be you. And that when you live your life, you'll be realized that it was an art form. <laughs> it wasn't something you were meant to get right. You weren't meant to figure it out any more than you're meant to figure out music or love. But you were meant to finally go, my, I experienced life through these eyes of unique vision and difficulty. But at the end of the day, I realized I was part of a great commitment on the part of some greater spirit to say, can you participate? Maybe like cells in a greater body. Might be an easier journey, a difficult journey, but you know what? We're all adding to it. And that to me is the DNA of the phoenix, mm. meaning the sacred geometry of who and what we are is we are each the one. We are each a phoenix, not born into time, but born into creation, whole and holy. And my question to everyone is, if you don't like the story you're telling, then why not tell when you do like? And for me, when I sit in this room, I don't need more. This is enough. This is beautiful enough. This explains with art and beauty and intimacy that the human struggle to know itself needed to create a narrative that included all of itself and not in the act of judgment, not in the act of betrayal, but in the act of artistry, of devotion and dedication, because that's our heart. Our heart is our heart, but our heart is pulsing in all of these other books. Mm -hmm. That's the human heart. Do you see how beautiful that is? To breathe into this great human story and then breathe into the, the intimacy of our moment and then begin to say, yeah, it's time to grow up. Not to embrace the inner child, but to embrace the inner guardian that says, you can take care of the child now. <laughs> mm. Take care of that child. Yeah. But I need you to be a guardian. Mm. I need you to be responsible. Because if it's just the child, you'll sit waiting. You'll think, oh, I'm special. Mm. <laughs> and the thing is, we are special, but we're special in the ways we don't understand. Sure. You know, because it's much more. And well, Salvador Dali said it best. He goes, no lazy artist ever creates a masterpiece. Mm. And I thought, if we take the artist as the human race, we have never been lazy. Parts of us are lazy, parts of us are lazy. 
But when you get right down to it, we might be Sisyphus pushing that rock up the hill <laughs> only to have it roll back down over and over again. But at least we're willing to push it up the hill again. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of I kind of feel like this cheerleader going, guys, do you know how amazing we really are if you get right down to it? To forget, to never know, to to have to go in the dark, to get lost, to to be afraid, and then to say, oh, it was up to me all along. Yeah, we're we're special not because we are owed something from the external. We're special because, as you have put multiple times, we are heroic for choosing not to know, for choosing not to remember, yeah. and for partaking and rolling that stone up the hill, even if it might fall back down again. Yeah. It is heroic, and we are special by the fact that we've signed up for this. And if you think about telling your inner self, even with the, the you know, sort of the, the proviso, I might just be making this up, <laughs> <laughs> but it if... If you could argue that everything's being made up the way we look at it, because no one knows, then add this too. You know, in a way, just because, and that's part of my, because a lot of my work is, is a thought experiment. It's like, I, I think if I'd tried to figure out that, I never would have, right. it wouldn't happen. But it wasn't, it wasn't, there was no conceit. There was no like, oh, this will turn into this. It was much more of, hmm, let's, you know, and, and, and that's why, you know, a lot of this is, I, I think that, that so much of the approach has been, the grand, the numbers, the demographic, and like parting the Red Seas, you know, and that's why all of our movies are, uh, you know, just, at least for me, <laughs> calm down on the CGI, dudes. Mm, I know. <laughs> Give me a bit more narrative. Oh, yeah. You know, My God, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm tired of watching Paris go. I'm, and I'm and it, 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 it <laughs> seems like, we, we've, I'm getting derailed here a little bit, but um, something that Chase and I have talked about is like, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of original thoughts original no. stories being told it's either oh there's this story let's do a prequel there's this story let's do a sequel or a second third fourth sequel yes. right with all these superhero uh, movies and it's been so long i feel like since we've had a trend of original ideas being birthed Yes. In in the space of of movies, well, and I sit I sit mm-hmm. in this ancient technology that we're in here today in this arc, and I look at the artistic representations of Lee's brilliant mind, and I I even if I can't define it, I go I know this. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah, this yeah. resonates with me, and I feel seen by it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't say that amongst. Avengers movie number 15, the CGI porn gives me that feeling. Now, and, there's nothing yeah. wrong with those movies. I have a blast and we can all, you know, crush popcorn and, and mm-hmm. watch our, you know, neurotransmitters freak out by all the colors. Right. But at the same time, I'm not uh, entering a layer of depth within myself that I would not have been should I should I skip the, the movie. And, and, and being yeah. in a space like this is a level of recognition. Um, but also novelty. And I think that that's very key because it's not one or the other, but really the recognition of that if everything is stimulation, then we do need to walk into where there's no stimulation. You know, this mm-hmm. this balancing of our energies. And I think that that's what a lot of this is about. Like, like yeah, we're getting to the point where formula is so obvious, it's just, it's it's a lack of imagination, meaning that if it's predicated on what sells and then you find what sells and then you turn what should be a half hour show into five hours, you know, in other words, that that that, that type of, of mind, mindset, which is in a way a great deal of the business itself, I do feel, this is what I felt even going back to my experience, was I realized I couldn't make that the bad guy. But I realized that if I was going to have any other conversation than being swept into that one, I had to cultivate it for myself. And that's when I, again, started getting together with different curious people and saying, let's let's start reading text. Let's start let's start inspiring each other. Really, like you'd say, like actors do when they come together to rehearse. Let's Let's be the crucible by which... Mm-hmm we create the conditions that even if it's not known by others at least it's it's nourishing us and and that to me is a lot of what's going on is this sense of that 
and I do think of it as a type of autoimmune reaction, meaning like, like when this doesn't work, go soft focus. Listen to associations, you know, listen to the things that aren't um, trying to get your attention. And mm -hmm. I think that that's what it is. This entertainment becomes so much about being a distraction. Mm -hmm. yeah um, and dissipation ultimately because you can only take so much shock mm -hmm. that that and and violence to the point there's a you know uh, well that's another story but but just it's it we have to in the same way we watch the diet we put into our body it's not that sugar is bad completely but it's the levels by which you live mm -hmm. by it and i think that that's the same thing with violence i think the same thing with everything else i think um Something in general that that has really resonated with me in our conversation before we pushed record, honestly, within the first five minutes of us walking into your door, really, um, was this concept of focusing more on what you love rather than what you hate. Right. right. And that is such a perfect snapshot of what I see a lot of humanity focusing on, uh, or rather the experience of um, my fellow man and woman, is we are spending way too much time, all of us, I'm not immune from this, mm -hmm. focusing on what we hate rather than what we love. Yeah. And that is definitely something that I'm gonna take away from this conversation and our, our time with you. Mm. And it's something that I'm going to write about, meditate on. What do I love? What do I want to focus on Beautiful. in my life, in my relationship, in my inner world? Um, really, that <laughs> is like, I feel like it's my new life motto, honestly, mm -hmm. um, because it's so easy for all of us to slip into, but wait, look at them, what they're doing over there. That's not good. That's not good. That's not good. And pretty soon your whole day, your whole, <sighs> your battery of consciousness, your battery of Absolutely. attention is spent on <laughs> something that you hate. Yeah. And, you know, I'll, I'll never forget when I was in driver's ed, one of the pieces of advice that the teacher gave to us is, you know, I grew up, we grew up in the Pacific Northwest in Washington state. Winters are brutal, you know, six inches of ice on the ground, mm. you know, in January and February. And he, he gave us a piece of advice. He, he said, it, if you feel like you are on ice and slipping or whatever, your car is going out of control, don't look at what you want, what you don't want to hit, right? So, oh, there's a pole. There's a light pole there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't look at the light pole. Look at where you want to go. Your chances of getting in an accident will go down if you are looking at where you want to go rather than where you don't want to go. And it feels so um it feels so in alignment with what what i was just saying with you you know um what i'm going to take away from this experience and this this conversation with you. you and that feels like something that everyone listening everyone in the world not mm -hmm. everyone in the world is listening of course <laughs> but if everyone in the world did that in their own life they focused on more of what they love than what they hate i, I feel like our world could completely transform. Absolutely. That's what I'm taking from this conversation. But I, I want to hear from you if there's, you know, people are listening right now where they're on the path of self development, of leveling up their consciousness. Sometimes that can feel like a very lofty pursuit. It can feel like, man, it's never enough. I'm never done, which is true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Um, but what would you say to that person that is trying to level up their consciousness? What's one thing that we can all do today? Immediately, I think, be kind to yourself. Hmm. There's nothing to prove and no one to prove it to, and there's no time schedule. You know, we impose a lot of these outer models onto this inner life. And if you think more from a gardener's perspective of allowing a seed to grow in the dark, not worry, you know, and understanding this is a gestational process, and I also tell people about the creative process. I say a lot of times people, oh, why don't I feel creative? I say, tides come, you know, they ebb and they flow. And the more we, I think, honor that natural element within ourselves, the more we are able to recognize that, you know, there's a wonderful, going back to Rilke, he said something wonderful. He said, he said, he said 
um, live the questions now. <laughs> I love that. And if you're lucky enough, you might live into some of the answers. And that's really what I feel about this art, that many of the, in a sense, the anguishes that, that got this out of me, if I'd stopped there, I would have thought, you know, I could not see the point, like a book. You know, it's like stopping at the third chapter of a 10-chapter book, you think. And I think that's what we must do for ourselves, is understand we're not a completed anything. Do you know, we really are. I, and I feel a lot of times, I even say, you know, just, just keep rowing. Just keep rowing. You know, don't, don't overthink it. Don't over... Because as we know, sometimes, um, and, and I even quoted in my book, it's natura non facet soltis. Nature does not grow in leaps, meaning that, that everything creates the condition of the foundation by which we have enough strength to support what is coming. So if we think about when we're in that, I don't know, and say, look, this is not wrong. This is the formative energies that will lead you to the next question. And you might say, well, what is that? I say, sometimes you don't know what the next question is until, in a sense, the anguish goes, I can't do it anymore. And then that moment you go, oh, I wasn't supposed to do anything. <laughs> do you know, it's like, do you know where it, 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 it we push, 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 push. And, and I do feel like that's, that's part of the, the permission to give oneself, to be patient with oneself, to be forgiving of oneself, and to recognize, as I talk about, that we have a very traumatized psyche, which we take personally, like, oh, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with everybody. <laughs> do you know? It's like we all have that I should be, but I'm not. I should do this, but I don't mm -hmm. want, you know. And I think if we recognize that, then we're not overstressing it. Do you know? It's like we don't make it a thing. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's part of it. And that allows us then to become more facile or flexible. And and that's why a lot of again the the nourishment routine the sense of of and, and I tell people with drawing I say look if you think oh I have to pull everything just say if you want to five minutes just I'm going to do this for five minutes when nobody's looking if you can step over that and do it suddenly unbeknownst to you on a quantum level you've created a new possibility hmm. you've made an effort. And what we make an effort toward makes an effort toward us. Mm -hmm. Nothing given, nothing, you know, nothing, if it's just this. And that's why, again, we're being taught etiquette. It's like, think of so much of the ego now that is blossomed into this outer, you can have everything temptation world. <laughs> You'll just feel empty forever. That's the only, you know, that's the downside. But I think that that's why Everything in this room is indicating that we've reached this point of resistance, resistance, resistance. But think of that as slowly turning us away from an old way of being and doing back into a more intimate way of being and doing. Meaning if there isn't one agreement or there's not one reality or there's not one point of view or there's not a monolithic this or that, then I don't have to bemoan that it's not there. I have to, again, like, as I say, go from the outward turning wheel of life experience. The months will still go by. You'll still get older. But if we turn and we stand finally at the center of the wheel, then we stand upright, just like the totem pole, like, like the center of the wheel, like the shushumna, this idea, or the toroid, meaning that, that what comes up through the top of us then our energy field then blossoms like a fountain out of us in all directions, winds down like an orb coming up through our feet. You see how we become that life atom. And that means the life atom, like the spin of an atom, if we think about it, that the spin of the atom defines the atom. There's no there there in an atom. So essentially the spin of our world defines our reality. But when we stand upright in that reality, it's like holding all of our greater stories but not being over-identified with them. Hmm. Do you see? That's like a library, right? You can read Moby Dick and go wailing, but you don't have to go there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You imaginatively have bridged. And because you've done that, you've allowed the imagination to awaken which the imagination is very grateful for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> think of a book that goes, I didn't think anybody was ever going to open me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you made right. an effort. Right. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, you know, as we come to a close, uh, something you said earlier 
you you mentioned the first flood was with water, water yeah. and we're now in the flood of information yeah. and and through some language of use throughout the day and throughout our conversation here for the podcast you know i can't help but think that that we craft our arc through consciousness of course through through what we love and we talked about some of those attributes of what we love what do we find safe what feels like home where can we create where can it be sustainable uh, where can it blossom and we create this this arc to navigate the the floodwaters if you will and um i think even the the question of great that's a beautiful metaphor what am i supposed to do Mm-hmm. And and what you just answered is is we'll have patience. And yeah. uh, we talked about we talked about this. You're the hero of your own story. And and this story, this sailing or boating of the ark on the the flood 2.0 of information, um, is one that's heroic because we don't necessarily know what we're supposed to do. And, we, yeah. And it's yeah. this it's this attribute of patience that says I don't know. But I'm here to create the story that resonates, and I know it's heroic. And literally so, the opposite of instant gratification. Literally the opposite of instant gratification. Yeah. And okay. and so as I kind of piece these things together from from what we talked about today, that that will definitely land, and and I will take you know take that away from from this conversation. That's beautiful. That's really I, I and I feel like that's what this is about. Just recontextualizing. You know, giving ourselves a break. You know, mm-hmm. not trying to have this perfected. I am this, and you're not. No, we are all each this. Mm-hmm. So what is your music? What is your story? And in the library, it's all honored. Mm. Do you know, that's why yeah. I do. I, I really feel that, that, and as I, I told you, we were looking about, I said that when my dad died, I, I just I just so, so remember his book of life. I could, I could see it being squeezed in all the waters of this life that had spread out, in a sense, to be interpreted by the way he journeyed. But as it was closed, it there was such a reverent voice that said, "Ah, oh, but now it's been lived." And I thought, I felt like Scrooge after the third night, going, <laughs> "God Almighty, guys, we don't have any idea where the art form. You know, we think we're not it, we're not, and that our struggles are because we're bad or this. Uh, it's it's way more beautiful than that. We are artists of creation and consciousness. That we came from being star beings, but in that." mind you are I, you know directly so you cannot create mm. you are to create you had to forget mm. and in forgetting what was lost was actually to be rediscovered but in human terms mm. and you see so we sto- slowed down star knowledge what was once directly connected to the heavens and we humanized it mm. we turned it on the wheel of time but now this wheel of time has brought us imperceptibly back to the final question, which is the intimacy of who are you? Where do you live? What do you love? And you are in charge of what you allow to define your world. And I really do. I think that that's where we become gardeners of the soul. That's why this is called the hieroglyph of the human soul. Hieroglyph means picture, sacred pictures. So we're in a picture book that is multidimensional but fixed that holds its story on the spines of all the stories. And I feel that that's such an appropriate embrace that although we can never see why would it, we would endure and why seemingly ordinary lives are lived and lost and why, but if we honor it as a noble enterprise, not that we recognize or figure out anymore, we figure out mountains, but we recognize we're in some incredible story mm. that asks us, look, there are many versions of you. They're all you. So what will the version be? And put a little effort into it. It, it takes a little effort, but so does love. Yeah. So does anything you love. Having a cat takes effort. (laughs) Do you know? They don't clean their cat boxes. (laughs) You know, and and I do. I feel like that's what the world is trying to teach us. Mm -hmm. Anything you love, you make an effort for. Mm -hmm. So if you're wondering why these other things aren't going on, make a little effort. Mm -hmm. Start the relationship. And don't start big. Start intimate. Start in a corner that says, I don't know. 
I just had to tell you I love you because I'm getting exhausted telling everyone I hate them. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and I'll tell you, that's when consciousness goes, oh, yeah. finally you're listening. Yeah. 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 You know? yeah. Spot on. Yeah. Lee, where can people find more of you? Uh, you have a beautiful YouTube channel that we will include in our show notes, as well right. as your social media, which is incredible, and, and the segments that you do around you know different locations of of this library, um, but also just uh, you know beautiful articulation of, of thoughts and breakthroughs that you've Thank that I'm sure you've had over the years. Where else can people find you? You have an incredible uh, history of writing as well, and so I want to point people towards. Uh, places they can find your work yeah uh, that's thank you i i have lee mccloskey.com i am on facebook lee mccloskey facebook out in public i also have olandar foundation for emerging renaissance which is on facebook but since i don't put any money into it it's probably you know <laughs> you have to go to it and then then the youtube channel and really it, with carla and i we do a lot of events here and if people are in la or the la area it's to reach out through my website, let me know, and because um, we have events here and I do walkabouts. And, and we always have a presenter or a performer as well because mm. one of the great keys for me is not to make it the, you know, the lone creative talking about the work, but to actually make it, no, now we move into the sound bath or now we move mm. into, you know, so, so that it's like, that's what we've all been trying to yeah. do. We're trying to bring the theater back together, this, this ensemble. So. Uh, I am on Instagram, Lee J. McCloskey. Please uh, look at my Instagram. I I try to keep that interesting. And of course, they have a limitation on how long things can <laughs> yeah. be. So some of the things I've written that I put on Facebook, I go, I'll put the picture on Instagram. And then, but my, my books also, and probably you've talked about, but, but Tarot Revisioned, um, Adam Reborn and Eve Restored in the Splendor, my Codex Tor books, if you look up Cosmogramma, really Googling, like I did the, the cover art from my my uh, books, the Codex Tour for Flying Lotus, and my grimoire toured with the Rolling Stones in mm. 2005, 2007. So those things are online, but but really just to get in touch with me, probably Um right. But do look at the YouTube channel if, if they can, because I'm really just trying to, like today, I, I just feel that that the whole point of the conversation is to have it, mm -hmm. and if you have it, then invite others. Because I'm convinced that good ideas can go viral just as easily mm -hmm. yep. as bad ideas. Right. You right. know, <laughs> so let's work on the good ideas, and if we have to be patient, we will be. Yeah. But I do. I feel like the patience now is. I want a story that, from where this center emerges, it begins to reclaim and honor the center which is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere mm -hmm. yeah. i love that quote amen yeah, I do too. so good yeah amen. thank you so much my friend thank you what so a beautiful much day thank for, you i mean we were coming over here for an interview and we basically spent the whole day with you yeah, which was incredible. such a treat and uh, two hours in your library uh that is probably one of the coolest if not the coolest room <laughs> that Bless. i've ever been in and just you know um want to inspire anyone out there listening if you're in the la or malibu area and, and you can make it here in some way shape or form it is absolutely worth it you yes. will never see anything like this no. again um i am sure of it <laughs> um thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us and your your beautiful art oh. um, and your cats. with us and your cats. <laughs> yes, I have absolutely gotten my creature fixed today and <laughs> have the hair on my pants and clothing to prove it. And I'm, I, yes. I'm taking it as a token of love. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, we've just had an, a wonderful time. And um, uh, thank you for all of your gifts. Oh well, thank you so much. It's been absolute delight hanging out with you guys yes. and talking and i do i feel the better story heals in ways we can't begin to imagine and thanks for sharing the better story mm -hmm. thanks for what you do and may all sorts of grace and wondrous success just flourish mm -hmm. and really share your message and how you're you're really your ideals of sharing the better story which i share so much with you mm -hmm. so 
bless you both. Thank you. Really, thank, thank you. you really. Thank you. We received that. To everyone listening, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, we will talk to you next time. Go spread some light and find some creativity and remember to focus on more of what you love, less of what you hate. If, if you took anything from this conversation, take that, stick it in your pocket and run with it. Talk to you next time. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed that, check out right over here for some more fun clips. Oh, and you're going to want to subscribe. Bye.